From the British perspective, Market Garden had not been a failure because Monty got his American Dominion troops under his command and he got them poised to march into Hanover on his way to Berlin while all the other Americans were strung out thinly and being starved for ammo and gasoline as all supplies were being funneled to Monty. Having crossed the Rhine on the 23rd of March in a small boat with Churchill, to stand in Germany for a half hour. Nobody had come halfway to meet Monty during their Operation Plunder, and so they launched Operation Archway on the 25th of March that was 300 SAS in 100 armed jeeps with supporting trucks sent across the Rhine into northern Germany with 700 more SAS sent on the 7th of April for Operation Amherst. As the SAS spread out to make contact with Germans. Some were delayed at Bergen-Belsen on the 15th of April, and others didn't reach their objectives until the end of April, while many of the SAS abandoned their missions to head towards Dresden, where they joined other SAS agents looking for their first commander, David Sterling, who was being held prisoner in the Kolditz Castle near Dresden, a castle that had been used as a mental hospital for the incurably insane for the past 100 years. The Americans had captured Kolditz Castle on the 16th of April and two days later captured the monument to the Battle of the Nations in Leipzig that had been built in honor of Napoleon's defeat and the huge monument had a statue of Michael the Archangel out front, known as the Guardian of Germans in Battle. The SAS were having more trouble wearing German uniforms in Germany than they had in France, where they'd gotten away with it more often, and Sterling had started the SAS with a code of utmost secrecy that the Americans had been less likely to appreciate. Sterling's commandos were trained to commit spying and sabotage, and they were able to call in airstrikes on uncooperative Frenchmen or Americans or Germans, and the SAS would blow up warehouses and train tracks and command posts, and the SAS were the primary weapon in Monty's control of the flow of supplies. SAS sabotage would be blamed on the French, who then suffered reprisals from the Germans, such as when 99 civilians were hanged in Toul on the 9th of June in 1944, and when the SAS killed 40 Germans at Orador sur Glane, the Germans in reprisal murdered 700 French civilians trying to find the SAS, and both the French and the Germans stayed on the hunt for the SAS, whose activities remain to this day a closely guarded secret. The SAS had started in Normandy with Operation Bull Basket on the 6th of June for D-Day, but Bull Basket had been ordered back to England on the 24th of July, and the SAS had been sent in the following day for Operation Gaff, and the SAS was called Churchill's Secret Army, and they had killed Heydrich in May of 1942, and they would try to kill Hitler unsuccessfully several times. The American president, FDR, died on the 12th of April in 1945, and Hitler got his miracle, just the same as Frederick the Great had, when the enemy's leader died right in the middle of Germany's darkest hour, and it was assumed by the British that the Americans would be in disarray and mourning and confusion over FDR's death, so by the time they buried FDR and sorted out the succession, all the German POWs could be given back their weapons with fresh ammo and infused with renewed hope that they could stop the Russians heading for Berlin, and then the American troops would have no choice but to join them because U.S. soldiers would be impossibly outnumbered as Germany was marching with Monte's Dominion troops. Unfortunately for the Germans, the chain of command in the U.S. Army gave generals more flexibility than in the German chain of command, so Ike did not need permission from FDR to act and could make decisions on his own without presidential permission, while the Germans were not allowed to make a move without any explicit okay from Hitler. 
Monty had never fully embraced the reality that Ike was the su supreme commander, expecting Monty to follow orders from Ike, and Monty felt his single thrust idea was supported by the board of directors at Chafe, so rejecting orders from Ike or bypassing any directives Monty saw as contradictory was fair game in Monty's mind, and he continually gave mere lip service to General Eisenhower, and in turn would be awarded with responses and letters from the Supreme Commander that kept up the appearance that the Americans were working together with the British. While Ike publicly pretended he was in sync with his British counterparts, it was for the most part simply maintaining a charade, lest the whole thing spin completely out of control, pushing the British to operate openly alongside the German army, fatally endangering American troops, since the battlefield was its own world where guns were more powerful than paper. While the telephone had been a powerful tool, it could also be blamed for Hitler's downfall because it put him in direct contact with his ground forces and their commanders. Thus, they necessarily had to hesitate at crucial moments when immediate action would have saved the day. The Americans were constantly on the move, while Monty continually insisted on keeping his lines neat and tidy, and Monty would give up territory already won so that he could make his boundaries more straight and clear, allowing the enemy to know exactly where he stood. On the 19th of April, the German radio announced that a separate peace had been arranged between Himmler and Great Britain and the United States, in that order, but they reported that the Russians were refusing to agree to the peace. FDR had died the week before of a heart attack, and the War of American Independence had begun on the 19th of April in 1775, and on the 4th of April the American Third Army had overrun Ordruf a sub-camp of Buchenwald, and Patton demanded that the world know about Buchenwald, despite the British insisting these camps be kept secret. The Germans had been evacuating concentration camps in front of the Russians, but they'd been told that Patton would not be coming anywhere near Ordruf, so the inadequate attempts to move those prisoners away and to burn the camps had been more terrible than successful. And after Ike saw what had been going on in the prison camps in Germany, the recriminations towards Patton for having tried to liberate the compound where his son-in-law was being held were immediately lifted. Patton had sent over 300 men and 16 tanks with supporting vehicles on the 26th of March behind enemy lines over 50 miles to liberate the camp, but his mission had failed with only 35 men coming back and all vehicles lost. Patton would say later that he should have sent three times that amount of manpower, and while transportation was an utmost necessity for the war effort, just as necessary was the flow of information through the public news media, and so the American Edward R. Murrow broadcast his report from Buchenwald on the 15th of April, and while Murrow had been broadcasting from the BBC studios to America, working for CBS News, Murrow's reports had been completely controlled by the censors at Britain's Ministry of Information. After word got out about Buchenwald, all bets were off. The British had reached Bergen-Belsen on the 11th of April and made a deal with Himmler that allowed the Germans to continue to manage the camp and set up an exclusion zone five miles wide around it to prevent the spread of typhus. Unfortunately for that deal, an SAS officer with his jeep driver accidentally stumbled on the camp and blew the whistle, so the British Army had to take over Bergen-Belsen on the 15th of April, where 20,000 Russian POWs had died. Bergen-Belsen was right near Selle, that was 20 miles north of the ancient capital of Hanover, and the British 11th Army armored found 13,000 corpses and 60,000 walking skeletons in Bergen-Belsen, and these British soldiers would later have the privilege of arresting the Flensburg government. Operation Lumberjack 
had begun for the Americans on the 1st of March in 1945 with Patton's 3rd Army, along with Bradley's 1st Army going after Cologne. But Monty had told the Americans to stay on the west bank of the Rhine and to clear out both the Eiffel Mountains and the Moselle Valley, where there were over 75,000 German soldiers. And this was the task Monty had given the Americans while the British marched ahead up north across the Rhine towards Berlin. However, American generals had freedom of decision on the ground, as opposed to the British and German method of tightly held reins, just as Western horses were allowed to think for themselves, while English riders were required to control the animal's every move. During Lumberjack, the Americans suffered 100 casualties to the Germans, 5,700 killed and wounded, and Patton had interpreted his orders as, quote, aggressive defense, close quote, and moving towards the Rhine with a low profile, using, quote, unquote, armored reconnaissance, with his seven divisions now supplied through Dragoon, and Patton told Ike that moving forward was just training exercise for the new troops. On the 5th of March, Ike unleashed Patton to go ahead into the rest of the Rhineland, because as soon as Monty found out about Lumberjack, he sent the RAF on the 3rd of March to bomb the historic Bezudenhout neighborhood near the Hague, even though the Hague even though Monty claimed to have been targeting V-2 rocket launchers in a park a half mile to the west, but said the RAF had suffered from navigational errors. By the 10th of March, Patton had advanced 55 miles in less than 48 hours, just three days after seizing the bridge at Remagen. And Patton called Bradley and said, For God's sake, tell the world we're across. I want the world to know Third Army made it before Monty. However, Bradley's headquarters had already made that announcement, and Bradley had also told the press corps, emphasizing that it had been accomplished, quote, without benefit of aerial bombing, ground smoke, artillery preparation, and airborne assistance, close quote. It had been reported to us that our adjacent corps of the South had just succeeded in capturing the Remagen Railroad Bridge across the Rhine River and captured it intact. This was welcome news. My battalion commander dispatched me with two of our forward observers to cross the Rhine and establish an observation post to adjust our, our artillery fire. When I reached the bridge, which was three or four hours after its capture, the west side was cluttered with vehicles trying to cross the river. Many of these people had a mission on the east bank, but additionally there was a great number of gawkers and spectators who simply wanted to cross for posterity's sake. Posterity's sake. I explained my mission to the officer in charge and received permission for almost an immediate crossing. I did have time enough to ask how the bridge was captured and received the answer that later became historic news. An engineer lieutenant with several enlisted men ran across the bridge, kicking and throwing explosive charges into the river below, never knowing when the Germans would activate their detonator. This was an extremely brave act. At any moment during the ten or fifteen minutes it took to accomplish this task, all of them could have been blown to kingdom come. We crossed the bridge and established two observation posts on the east bank. I left the two observers with their food and equipment. I then recrossed the bridge. Several days later the bridge collapsed as a result of previous bombing, but by that time we had finished two bridges downriver from the Remagen Bridge. The first bridge was a pontoon bridge constructed by two engineer battalions. My corps commander offered to provide beer for the men of these battalions if they could give him a bridge in less than twelve hours. They did, and he did. However, the bridge was a sight to behold. They worked so rapidly that some of the pontoon anchors slipped, causing the total bridge to be a series of S-curves, a sort of zigzag across the Rhine River. It was sturdy, however, permitting traffic as soon as it was completed. The bridge was well-named Beer Bridge and served well for many weeks. A Journey Through Memory by Robert W. Clyerhue, San Francisco, Robert W. Clyerhue, 1995, page 77 and 8. 
Indeed, Eisenhower would not approve the First Army portion of Lumberjack until March 3, one week after Lumberjack had started, and only then orally and upon a firm understanding that Patton, after seizing Trier, Trier, would swing major forces southeast over the Moselle, not until March 13, six days after Bradley's seizure of a Rhine bridgehead at Remagen, would Eisenhower approve Lumberjack in writing. Bradley would hail Eisenhower's action as, quote, one of the most significant orders of the war, close quote, a major shift in plan ordered without approval of the combined chief, though the record does not bear him out. Eisenhower at War, page 674. The Germans' Operation Spring Awakening in Hungary began on the 6th of March and kicked off in response to the Americans' lumberjack, and Spring Awakening only lasted ten days, and used German troops who had escaped from the bulge, and it would be the last German offensive in the East, but would fail to keep the Russians out of Hungary. <laughs> 